pleasure to introduce to you this morning our next speaker, Arthur Covington, who I think can properly be called the father of Canadian radio astronomy. Art was born in Regina, Saskatchewan in 1913 and received his Bachelor of Arts degree in physics and mathematics in 1938. In 1940, he received his Master of Arts degree from the University of British Columbia. And in 1942, he came to the National Research Council, where he worked until his retirement a number of years ago. Now, at the time that Art joined NRC, Grote Reber had been making his observations of the galaxy and also of the sun. And uh, one of the things Art will tell us about is how the work, the work that Grote Reber did influenced the early work that he undertook here in Canada. Art began in 1947 to make daily observations of the sun at 10.7 centimeters wavelength. He used a four foot diameter parabolic reflector for this work. And this was really the beginning of radio astronomy in Canada. And from 1947 to 1987, marks a span of 40 years. So this morning, in addition to the other celebrations, we are celebrating the 40th year of radio astronomy in Canada. Now the work begun by Art was a very careful series of daily measurements of the solar flux at 10.7 centimeters. It has been carried on by him throughout his career at the NRC. The Work has indeed been continued after Art retired by Ken Tapping and his associates. The antenna uh, is now located at the Algonquin Radio Observatory, and observations are made daily of the sun. The information is sent internationally to a number of organizations, promulgated very widely. It has been found over the years that the 10.7 centimeter solar index is an excellent indicator of solar activity. And in fact, it correlates very well with the optical sunspot number. And I believe that nowadays, people who use these indices are probably thinking more in terms of continuing the 10.7 centimeter solar index from NRC than, uh, than continuing the uh, optical sunspot numbers. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you Arthur Covington, who will speak to us on Grote Reber in the beginnings of Canadian radio astronomy at the National Research Council. Art? Uh, thank you very much, John. You have done a good part of my work, so I won't repeat some of the details, except as they come out in the historical sense. Well, as you were talking about history, and I remember Grote Reber's comment of, some, of being nervous, we do have to expose ourselves. And that's a very hard thing to do sometimes. Uh, I seldom speak in public. And uh, the last time I was at such a meeting, I think it was in Green Bank at the uh, Jansky Symposium. And there I had the privilege of uh, bringing to a much larger, larger audience the role of the 10 centimeter magnetron brought to North America mm -hmm. by Taffy Bowman. And I understand, in fact, I've seen it. It resides somewhere down in our science museum. Uh, as you know, uh, I moved from Kingston, from Ottawa to Kingston, uh, the move I retired in 78, and we re moved there about a year ago. And in the last nine months, I've been busy making an addition to our um, house down there. In fact, this afternoon, I hope the carpenters are putting on the baseboard so we can have it finished and have a Merry Christmas. <laughs> well, with that sort of a preliminary, I would like to read a few paragraphs to keep myself straight and then follow the 
reading portion with a number of slides which will refresh my memory on different points. Uh, when I accepted this invitation to participate in radio astronomy in Canada, 50 years of progress, Paul Fellman stressed that I should keep within the theme of it as an anniversary for Groat. I am pleased and more than willing to do so for my introduction to radio astronomy occurred sometime in 1939 when I was browsing through the journals of the UBC library. Although I cannot recall the name of the author or the journal, I would hazard as a first guess an article in Reviews of Modern Physics. More important, as an amateur telescope maker, I was impressed with Reber's 30-foot diameter parabolic reflector. When I told this to Paul Fellman, he had the library in Canada start a search and was informed by telephone that the UBC library has found a possible candidate for the article that stimulated me. And just a little while ago, he gave me a book, um, radio, and in this page, there's a picture of Roet Reber's telescope, which we've all seen. I'm sorry to say this doesn't fit in with my recollection because I can remember, <laughs> <laughs> or at least the book or the quote, there are words around the picture. <laughs> but nevertheless, it was that picture that uh, made me think. Um, these memories, blurred as they must be by these many years, have been based upon my experience as a wireless operator listening to radio static during watches and wondering about their origin. I don't recall whether or not my thesis work on the electron microscope had been selected or not at that time, but I do recall discussing cosmic static with two friends of the Vancouver Center of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada who'd introduced me to telescope making. And curiously enough, these two friends and a few others were, uh, there was Dean Buchanan and Gordon Shrum who got together and formed the um, Vancouver Center. I don't know what my friends thought, but the um, broad beam of the um, radio telescope, they were probably not impressed as most people were. But I, for one, was intrigued with the phrase cosmic static that appeared somewhere. And hence my question to Groat a few minutes ago. The second time I heard about Reber's observations occurred in an entirely different situation, sometime in 1943 here in Ottawa. This was one year after I joined the radio branch and occurred in an evening during a flight test of the long range early warning radar set at the radio field station. I had helped construct and adjust a 30 megahertz IF amplifier and was one of those standing in the background in a small hut in case a replacement was needed. At some stage in the test, I can recall a discussion between Harold Ferris and Don McKinley who were hovering over a PPI screen examining a band of weak noise. What was it? The operating room was small and crowded with equipment, some of it operating with very high voltages and high power capabilities. They were trying to keep those in the background informed as what was going on. I did not move to see the band, but can recall a comment that some noise may be the cosmic noise reported by some amateur. Then someone wanted to look outside to see where the constellation of Sagittarius was, but it was overcast and so we couldn't make, complete the experiment. Uh, my arrival at the radio field station occurred when the use of long waves was being superseded by shorter wavelengths, in particular those in the vicinity of 10 centimeters. My work with IF amplifiers ceased, and I was assigned to the microwave section to incorporate a high-powered magnetron, transmit-receive box, 
and crystal detector into a waveguide system. After the prototype was operational, other equipment was designed for the testing and maintenance of components in the field. There are now many descendants of this type of radar and are a familiar object at airports and on marine ships. The antenna is a parabolic cylinder which focuses the collected energy onto a slotted waveguide array. At a later stage in the development of radio astronomy in Canada, that is sometime around 1950, the slotted waveguide array was of major importance. In fact, its use was a salvation for radio astronomy here in Canada. Uh, we have a lot of history to go through, papers. In fact, I brought probably too many and missing some. But uh, Bill Middleton has been able to uh, bring together an important collection, Radar Development in Canada, the radio branch of NRC 1939 to 46. And uh, details can be gathered from there. Um, the technology using shorter and shorter wavelengths developed and led to radar sets with greatly increased resolution. In 1945, I was assigned to field testing a one centimeter radar antenna. At this time, I find it interesting to recall that there were occasional discussions within our immediate group of what should be done when peace came. NRC at that time had been diverted from a peacetime operation to a full-time uh, wartime operation. There should be long-range plans of a non-military nature. As one who is often pessimistic rather than optimistic, I've often wondered how and where such suggestions originated at a time when there were so many gloomy wartime reports. Thus, it was not as a complete surprise that when peace did arrive, C.J. McKenzie, then president of NRC, actively encouraged us to speculate and to invite us to submit suggestions for new projects. Fred Saunders became involved in the creation of the Defense Research Board, which would take much of the military work from NRC. I know I'm in a very political area, and I know no further details than what uh, was given to us at the time. He resigned his position as microwave head and was succeeded by W.J. Henderson. Henderson, a graduate of Cambridge University, and just within the last two or three years of physics today, you'll see a reference to uh, Bill Henderson and his early work on the mass of the neutrino. In fact, I think it's one of the first experiments. He did it with Ellis, so it's Ellis and, and Henderson that you look for. Unfortunately, there are a lot of Hendersons in Canadian literature, and this is W.J. Bill Henderson. Uh, thus, it was in this atmosphere that Reber's experimental work returned to my mind when I was evaluating what steps should be taken for my own future. The Regidar programs have created very active and sensitive receivers. Southworth's initial reports indicated that the solar microwave emission was close to that of a black body. A quick experiment could be made to determine the cosmic noise intensity at 3,000 megahertz, a frequency on which Reber has just indicated he's been unsuccessful. In these recalls of memories of memories, I am not too sure, but I'm inclined to think that I was thinking of this experiment as an extension from Reber's report of 160 megahertz rather than the negative result he reported. Um, my proposal for research in cosmic noise was made to Bill Henderson while he was looking for a leak in the vacuum system of the tube lab somewhere in the basement of this building. Coming here, I was wondering just what room it was, but things do change. The proposal was accepted, and arrangements were made to have the antenna testing taken over by someone from Research Enterprises, which was then just closing down, in Toronto, that is. 
This person turned out to be Gordon Byers, who became the interim secretary for an early meeting of physicists in Canada interested in forming an association. I then had the task of finding parts for a small parabolic reflector which could be made into a radio telescope with the aid of the existing 10 centimeter Dickey chopper. And uh, Bill Henderson was more anxious to proceed at three centimeters because he had more equipment in that area than I did. And uh, he went ahead and suggested the the design of a 30-foot reflector after the manner of Reader, Reber. It was assumed that the sharper beam would automatically produce new results. The design was actually carried out by Frank Ward, who was an aircraft engineer, but two or three years after this initial move, he left and got employment elsewhere. Uh, that's the beginning of 1946 started with a clean slate for me. And a review at the end of the year shows that with the help of two technicians, uh, Sandy Kennedy and Ken Pryor, and the shops of the radio branch, 15 or 16 episodes can be recorded. For a broad picture, I'll only refer to four of them. Uh, there was, first of all, the unexpected high temperatures for the solar disk and a single sunspot recorded with a broad beam and uh, watching for the, slowly, the appearance of the slowly varying component. Then there was the fortuitous newspaper reading of a coming eclipse by my wife and the priority given by the management of NRC to have the radio telescope operational for November 22nd one day before the eclipse on the 23rd. Sandy worked overtime. <laughs> uh, then there was the visit of Sir Edward Appleton to the radio field station a few days after the event and his two or three minute inspection of the record before it had been analyzed. Both of us, I think, were at a peak experience as, as you know, Appleton had been involved with the uh, English uh, radio astronomy. I kept on talking too long, and I could see uh, the president fidget and look at his aides, and my excuse was, well, I'm pleasing our guest, I'll just keep on talking. Sooner or later, I was told, well, there are other things to see. And finally, there was a newspaper account <coughs> with a headline on December 31st, this is 1946, Research Council now breaks a war secret hidden in the Metcalf Road laboratories over the past five years. There was a picture of the radio telescope, a flight distance indicator for the Trans-Canada Airways, Air Canada was called TCA in those days, and a radar antenna with, for the marine uh, operations in Halifax. As far as I can ascertain, it's one of the earliest that was uh, put into operation. It was 10 centimeters, but then it quickly developed over to 3 centimeters. Well, in the spring of 1947, there was a call of papers for a joint ire rc meeting in Washington. It was brought to my attention by G.A. Miller, who was then section head of the microwave section. I was pleased to give a paper on the eclipse results and the first few months of the continuous observations of the 10 centimeter flux. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to know that every now and then I can uh, tune in WWV and hear the voice announcement amongst the static that the radio flux is so many units amongst a lot of other geophysical information. Uh, IRSI, Union Radio Scientific International, the International Union, has been of major importance in the development of radio since its formation in 1913 and has survived two world wars. I did not know about it until uh, oh, about well, 1947, nor did I know that Appleton was its president. 
he went from 1934 to about 1954. Canada was not a member of RC in 46 or 47, and the Canadians attended the Washington session as observers. There was the open door policy of the United States authorities. Uh, Uh, this, Wash this Washington meeting was one of the first after the war, and many of us felt it recognized the open nature of scientific exchange. In looking through the um, programs, I've attended a lot of conferences, <laughs> and I'm statistically minded. I know there were three papers on radio astronomy, one by Grote Reber, another by Jack Herbstreet of NBS, and of course mine, and a total of 98 was given. Well, there were subsequent IRC IR meetings in following years, spring and fall, in Washington and other places. These served as a forum for the emerging science of radio astronomy. Then in June 1949, the AAS held its 81st meeting in Ottawa, and the pattern seems to have changed. And I have a Xerox copy of that uh, meeting. Uh, there are not many. I have a note here. There are 39 papers given. There is a meteor paper by McKinley radar work, one by Peter Millman, and uh, then there were four radio astronomy. Um, Grote Reber again, solar radio waves, and uh, one by Denise, microwave solar noise and sunspots, and uh, well, when I said that number, I was noting here that Ralphie Williamson, who became involved in radio astronomy, gave a paper, but it doesn't appear to classify as radio. Others were actively involved with radio, and I recall Shapley and Seeger and Hagen and uh, Miss Starr, who worked on a bibliography at Cornell University. There was a visit to the Gothill Radio Observatory, and Grote Reaver, I think, had the fourth sight to carry his camera, and he snapped a picture of us. And, uh, what else? A picture with the science center. Hey, a picture with the science center. No, are they? Uh... In your day, and uh, Hagen. And yes. Yeah, it's out there. Hey, that picture's out there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you, you're the, you took it. <laughs> uh, there's a, a, a platform you'll see later. Yeah. And, uh, perhaps, I, I have a number in my slide, but you asked, is that, this was a historic occasion after getting up there and having an ad hoc uh, committee meeting on the validity of solar radio waves, and where would the linear correlation be best, at three centimeters, 10 centimeters, or your frequency? Uh, he said, has anybody got a camera? Historic occasion, you were the only one. You went to the tower and you snapped a picture. <laughs> Well, that inspired me <coughs> and uh, it gave me confidence, too. That, uh, well, then on uh, sometime in August, I wrote a memorandum with Jeff Miller's help to Ballard. And I'll now read parts of it. The proposed 150 by 24 foot slice has five times greater area than the 30 foot parabolic reflector formerly projected. This is made possible by reducing the tolerances so that the shortest wavelength to be used is 10 centimeters rather than one centimeter. A large parabolic 50-foot reflector is being constructed by the Naval Research Labs at Washington. This was Hagen's undertaking. Well, I was able, that's in August. Then in November, there was another Washington meeting and I was able to attend without presenting a paper and I remember 
get meeting you and you telling me about your proposed big dish and you invited me to your apartment and gave me some photographs. <laughs> there's the envelope. It's pretty brown. <laughs> They're browning and inside there's pictures already seen. I came back to Ottawa and showed Jeff Miller all this and uh, he was quite interested. And uh, then the next thing that happens is um, he writes a letter to our Hal Parsons, a mechanical engineer who was in New York attending to something to get in touch with you. <laughs> well, there's some letter on file somewhere. I have, um, oh, here, Mr. H.E. Parsons. Covington has just returned from Washington where he had long discussions on big dishes with Grote Reber at the Bureau of Standards. Art is enclosing two snapshots of Reber's model, which he would like to get back. I haven't got them back yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're in good hands. Uh, note that the, well, get into technical details. What happened next? Well, Hal did pay a visit, and he came back inspired, and he created two cardboard models, which are at the end of my series of slides. But before I get onto the slides, I'd like to read a line from a letter from Professor Ort to me. Mr. Reber, with whom I have also been in correspondence, writes that you have designed a machine for converting equatorial movements into the azimuthal arrangements of the large mirror. Uh, they passed this on to Parsons, and I believe he sent our preliminary uh, designs to Ort. I don't know quite what happened and because of the later change in program. Well, I think with that, I'd like to uh, show you the um, slides I have. <coughs> well, there's the uh, four-foot reflector. In finding these various parts, I can recall discussing the procurement of this four-foot reflector with uh, John E. Bell. He was telling me there were two or three hundred at the uh, REL, it would be a good idea to uh, make an array of these dishes. Well, that was all very fine, but I really didn't know how to handle that number. Uh, John Bell later became vice president of Canadian Aviation Electronics, and as you know, they are heavily engaged in uh, construction of simulators. Uh, this casting here is from the prototype of the uh, 268 radar, three centimeters. Um, the next slide, please. This is the radio field station, as it was in 1948. The first building is this one, building number two, where I spent uh, from 1945 to 52. The radio telescope you first saw was on a platform there. And uh, here's an ionosphere uh, sounder and hut that I had erected through Bill Torrington. Uh, Jeff Miller's office is there. McKinley's office was in this building. The guardhouse was there. Appleton's visit was so short that uh, it was decided to make a uh, step over a screen fence, which is here, 12 foot screen fence, so that he could save uh, uh, oh, 10 or 15 minutes, as he did want to visit this uh, long range um, radar. The tower is 200 feet high. Next slide, please. 
Oh, I mentioned the 10 centimeter Dickey chopper. The first time I connected it to a horn which was pointing to the zenith was the fifth. Um, it was a Sunday, I chose a Sunday because of minimum interference. And uh, this is late afternoon, I took a recording. Wilf Med had just joined the uh, staff then and he was living in a trailer in some standard housing adjacent to the radio field station. Housing was so short that he was living in a trailer. Well, about 6.30 or so, I came over and replaced uh, the horn with a, mission, with a flat load, a piece of carbon at ambient temperature. And examining the record, what impressed me was the smoothness of this record, except for that uh, extra glitch, comparison to the sky noise. And then I immediately was asked the question, what causes these fluctuations? And I could think of water vapor varying clouds going by, the ionosphere, and so on. This has not been um, published in any way. In fact, it would be something I would like to put on the record. Next slide, please. Well, on Janu July the 25th, uh, a visible um, sunspot was present. And I was so keen to um, make an observation that I took a drift <coughs> curve. The tracking motors were not available. And uh, this is the sun going through. Uh, zero of the meter is there. And uh, I didn't have a synchronous detector because I'd been accepting South Earth's values and expected the solar signal to be something like that. Instead, it was several times uh, greater. Well, that was that. Then in the evening, I was anxious to uh, observe so uh, cosmic noise. Uh, in fact, we had or later on set up a file, Research in Cosmic Noise, a title which stayed with us for about uh, 14 years. My wife and I went out and pointed the antenna towards Sagittarius. But before long, we noticed that the sky in the south was becoming very brilliantly yellow. And I knew that something unusual was happening. Well, we stayed out there and watched. The storm moved, the royal display moved northward. I moved the antenna toward the zenith. And at this time, oh, the uh, display moved suddenly from north, from south to north. And uh, there's a little glitch. The needle gave a kick. And of course, it's down in the noise. But I was so excited that uh, I thought that that kick was due to some sort of radio emission from Aurora. That particular... Uh, oh. uh, next slide, please. Oh, this is the... Um, I mentioned November 23rd partial eclipse. Uh, we were very fortunate in getting the equipment going, and here's the record. And right away you can see that these declines and rise in connection with these shadows indicates that that much emission comes from that sunspot area. And when you do the calculations, the value is about a million and a half degrees. Somewhere in my papers up here, I have a Xerox copy of the original record. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I mentioned the newspaper account of December 31st, which showed a radar um, antenna. Jeff Miller was in front of it. It was taken in Ottawa. Somehow or other, I acquired this um, photograph of the actual installation outside of Halifax. Uh, I've tried it's in Camperdown 
I think, and I've tried to find the building, but of course things do change. The next slide, please. Well, 1947, the patrol was started, as John mentioned, and one of the first things we observed were the uh, solar noise bursts at 10 centimeters. In those days, it was exceedingly almost impossible to get the spectroheliographs or filtergrams of the sun. And we relied upon uh, the sudden ionospheric disturbances uh, of uh, radio stations. Next slide, please. Um, of course, there's more than one frequency one can work on. And the idea was then in 19... Uh, 47, 48, that the flares were an explosion on the sun in some form or other, and streams of particles were shot out. And uh, the different frequencies were coming in at different times. And so it was quite important, our understanding, to um, be able to have simultaneous records of 10 centimeters and uh, 200 megacycles. Uh, when you do statistics, of course, you lose all the fine detail. Now, these are um, simultaneous recordings. And the first thing you notice is that the 10 centimeter burst is smooth, while the metric wavelength burst is rugged. And uh, right away, I knew that there would be the origin of sources were um, different. The next slide, please. Well, there's the Goth Hill Radio Observatory. I'd like to point out this um, horn. And also, this is the Dickey Chopper that was uh, used. The next slide, please. Uh, this is a radiometer. Uh, the horn swings so it can be connected to the receiver and to uh, thermal loads. Uh, it was to cover from 10 centimeters to 30 centimeters. Mm -hmm. I was showing this to Joe Posse in one of his trips, and uh, I hadn't known about the 21 centimeter line, and he asked me, well, are you going to measure it? Uh, well, with this sort of a wave meter, as you can see, and uh, the tube used, it certainly was an impossible thing to do. The next slide, please. Oh, here's the picture that Goat uh, took. And going around the circle, there's Wilf Mad, Charles Seeger, Alan Shapley, Denise Hagen, and myself. This is a quarter wave plate for measuring polarization. And there's a radio black box to put around the dipole to help in its calibration. Next slide, please. Uh, I was able to get a picture of Reaver when he visited us in 1956, in January. And this was in the receiver uh, building of uh, a compound interferometer. I've already given Grote a picture, a copy of this. <laughs> Next slide, please. Well, at that uh, meeting on the um, platform, we were discussing which would be the best index for solar activity. And uh, Denise went back to Washington, and about 1950, he came out with a statistical study. And three centimeters NRL, uh, Haddock and Hagen, essentially, NRC at Ottawa, Covington. And here we come to Reaver's work, 62 centimeters, Wheaton, Illinois. But you notice there's a gap here. And I think this just reflects the uh, very individualistic approach to growth. One could put in there, I don't know, the Wheaton Institute. <laughs> <laughs> One more slide, which is Hal Parsons, I hope. 
Oh no, the solar, this shows uh, the use of the 10 centimeter flux at Boulder, Colorado. Alan Shapley, years later, uh, the uh, forecaster on duty, showing an admiral from the US Navy, Ottawa 10 centimeter flux, Zerk sunspot number, and the planetary index. Well, the next slide will be uh, Parsons. Oh yes, this is the uh, reflector that um, Parsons made uh, after his visit with Groat. Well, John is uh, saying time goes on. John, there's only two more slides. Three more slides? Okay. Oh, Goth Hill Radio Observatory at the time of IGY. Four foot dishes there. The tower from which uh, Groat photographed that platform is there. 10 foot, 150 foot slotted wave guide array, and uh, the extension to make a compound interferometer. Next one. Oh, after IGY, with which I was quite intimately connected, um, the question came up what to do. Well, Wilf, Mad, and Norm Broughton decided to get into um, galactic noise. And so they converted this 10-foot dish for a transit mount. Oh, at the same time, a traveling wave tube arrived, and they are able to get much weaker signals. And so the first cosmic noise uh, record in Canada were obtained with this equipment. And it was about at this time that the file was changed from research and well, I kept the file researching you know, solar noise. I had to go to solar noise. <laughs> well, I guess new files are created for the uh, cosmic noise. Thank you very much, Eric. <laughs> Time for a couple of quick questions to Art. Yes. Paul? Art described the connection to Grove Reaper uh, in the sense that Grove gave him the idea for the that they were building a big dish out of Stony, West Virginia, and he carried it back here, and uh, it resulted in the model, at least in the idea for this uh, transit telescope. I have the backside there. From uh, uh, Art, you showed me the front side. What I'd really like to know is, was there a further connection? This project was canceled at the beginning of the Korean War, if I understand, or didn't go further uh, with the coming of the Korean War. And uh, I would like to know if somehow this connection to Grub Reaver uh, maintained itself when the 85 uh, foot telescope was eventually built at DRAO and when the um, Site 2 telescope was built at ARO and ultimately the 46 meter telescope. Is there a continuity, in fact, or were there many streams of influence beside the one that led to this? Well, there are many streams of influence, and one of them is uh, C.S. Beals, and the relationship of Beals to the Canadian Radio Wave Propagation Committee with Frank Davies. And then you go into Appleton. It's quite a long, complex story. But as far as another answer is, I can remember walking down the hall at the radio field station, and Parsons was saying, well, when are you going to make a decision of what are we going to do? He's quite a brisk Welshman, born in London. It sounded he could be very expressive. Better get off the pot. Well, I saw the Korean War coming on, and uh, there was an well, unpleasant situation, and I decided NRC could not carry through such an enormous magnitude at that time. So I said, well, let's forget about it. Well, then, either after or before that, McKinley asked me to do some radar work again. and. Uh, at that time, having done radar work once and the general feeling, I said, no, I <laughs> won't do it this time. <laughs> and uh, well, once you say no to a boss, I guess you start looking for jobs elsewhere. 
And uh, I had known Bill as a student from uh, UBC days. In fact, I introduced him to a physics club when there were only probably five students. And uh, we've always been friendly. And uh, so, uh, oh, well, then I told my story to Jeff, what had happened. Now, he had other ideas because I think he had uh, proposed this slotted wave guide array. And of course, there are two tests. It was 150 foot feet long, the longest it had been made. Would it work or not? And uh, we were planning to put it in a rather large parabolic cylinder. And uh, he persuaded the authorities. And the shop at NRC was fortunately free. The men who had worked on slotted wave guide arrays were standing around doing other things. And so he put people to work. And so with that sort of proposal, he said, well, you take a holiday. Oh, I hadn't had a holiday since uh, joining there. This is 58 years of working. <laughs> so I went to Vancouver and came back, and the slotted wave guide array was uh, built. And then Norm came on the sea. <laughs> So I guess I'll leave it at that. But your question, uh, I think, is worthy of a whole new conference. <laughs> One more question. Yeah. Dr. Joe. I heard you mention in uh, the same sort of thing that in those very early days, your papers were engineers, primarily not just for the applications were engineering. It's pretty clearly a history of technology, more roles in the history of science kind of thing. At what point? Did you people begin considering yourselves astronomers, not radio astronomers like hyphenated Canadian is not quite the Canadian. A radio astronomer in those days was really almost a species of engineer. Did you really ever feel yourself in those early days, say up until about 54, 55, as an astronomer as part of the astronomical? Well, I can give you two answers as usual. <laughs> My background is an amateur optical astronomer and amateur radio man. I, I feel more like an amateur astronomer. But then professionally, I think Lovell had a large influence in bringing the two groups together. And there's the Paris Symposium, a joint uh, conference held by IRSA and IAU. And so I think you have to look at it from the individual uh, effort and the uh, institutional uh, commitment. And I think this is where Jack Locke comes in in 1970, when the institutions came together. Of course, we all tend to be conservative, so individuals hang on to what they've done in the past. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Art. Thank you. Thank you for the congratulations as a yeah. person who has been I mentioned to Dr. Hertzberg that in this correspondence I have a letter from Van der Holst in which he mentions meeting you at Yerkes and I'd like to show it to you sometime. <laughs> <laughs>